Good evening, and welcome to the December edition of the Digging Deep podcast. I am Cindy Colley, and I have with me Carol Dodd, and we are very thankful for your being here tonight. Carol, welcome. Thank you. Thank Carol you. comes to us from West Palm Beach, Florida via Chattanooga for a couple of years, yes. or was it mm -hmm. two years or three, three years, years three in years. Chattanooga, and then recently she and her husband moved to our West Huntsville area and placed yes. their membership just a few weeks ago with the West Huntsville congregation, but you've been doing Digging Deep longer than that. How yes. long have you been doing? Uh, this, this is my, well, actually, it's only my second year, full year. I... Uh, got in on the sanctification study, okay. but I finished the study last year and have been involved in this this year. Good, great. Well, uh, tell us what your favorite thing about Digging Deep is. What is it, what's the benefit for your life? Well, is there a benefit? The, my favorite thing about Digging Deep is the fact that I'm digging deep in the Word because uh, it gives me an opportunity to um, study something that's structured, yeah. That it's uh, kind of motivating, yes, isn't it? yes. That I don't have to try to figure out what to study. Plus, it's giving me a chance to um, get to know a lot of other people and and see how much yeah. more everybody's into the word. That's kind of encouraging, isn't it? Yes. To know that other ladies are. And I was telling Glenn this morning, um, talk about accountability, <laughs> man. When you're going to do a podcast uh, for you know all of the people around the the United States who are the diggers, uh, you are, you have an accountability that is um, unlike any other. And it used to be that every year it seemed like my New Year's resolution was to uh, get into the word deeper and more. And I, I tell you what, this year, when I started to think about that, I thought, you know, I'm not doing better at everything, but I am doing better at getting into the Word because I am. I have to, and I like that. I like yes. that aspect of digging deep because it, it keeps us accountable. I want to say this, though. If you have, I know the holidays are difficult for some people, and I hope you had wonderful holidays, by the way, and I hope you're having a, a wonderful beginning to the new year, but um, it's easy to fall behind. And so I did some catching up this weekend, and I want to encourage you that it's not difficult to catch up if you've fallen behind for, uh, you know, say you're into last month's study or you didn't complete November's study. It's not difficult to catch up. But even if you feel like you've lost it, go ahead and jump in into January's study because it's a great time to begin again as we begin this new year next um, month. Uh, actually beginning now, our study is in the Psalms and the book of Ezra. I love the book of Ezra. Hannah Colley-Gizelbach, if you're listening, this I, I put Ezra in there this year, partly for you. So, because we have our Ezra, and I want him to grow up like the Ezra of the Bible. So we're going to be studying Psalms and Ezra during the month of January. For tonight, I have this... Um, big excitement about talking about Chronicles. Now, I never really imagined myself being that excited about Chronicles, but after I studied the prayers of the book of Chronicles, there's a lot of nuggets that I want us to find there, yes. a lot of things I want us to talk about tonight, so let's get into it. But before we do, I'm going to ask you, Carol, to take our petitions to God in prayer. And I apologize for not seeming to pay attention, but I'm trying to get my technology you know, the, up and running. The, I always say the devil's in the technology, <laughs> and tonight he has challenged us. We got to the to our set here tonight and uh, didn't have the password that we needed, so if we're out of breath, that's why. We're going to start, though, with our prayer, and we are going to dig. Holy Father, you are the one who has given us the privilege of prayer, and you listen to our prayers and you answer our prayers. And we are so very thankful for that. You are a God who is worthy of all praise, all honor, and adoration. And we pray that tonight, as we study your word, that we will give those to you. And that we will stand behind your word, not to put ourselves forward, not to make ourselves of any importance, but to put your word there and to know that if we follow your word and do as you say, that we will be pleasing and acceptable to you. We are so thankful for prayer, and we know that 
through your word, you have given us the ability to know how to pray. You've shown us what the power and the importance of prayer is. In your word, you have told us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we pray, Father, that our prayers will always be effectual and that they will always be, <clears throat> excuse me, they will always be effective and they will always be fervent. And we pray that you would be with us tonight, be with Cindy as she directs our minds in this study that she will pull out those little gems that will help us each day to live better lives for you as Christians and that our prayers will go up before you in a more meaningful way and that we will have a better understanding of what you want us to do as we come to you in prayer. We pray for all those ladies who are with us tonight who are following this study and we pray that you would be with them and bless them in their prayer lives. We pray that they will gain something from this that will help them to feel that they are closer to you through their prayers and through their service to you. We thank you so much for your word and for the book of Chronicles, which we don't always respect the way we should. And we are thankful for the opportunity that we have had to study it this month so that we could know a little bit more about those great men and how they prayed to you and how they, that can affect our lives. We just thank you so much for this study. And we thank you for all the women who are participating in it. For we know that they will be blessed. We pray that you would forgive our sins and help us as we strive to live better lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to just dig right in now, and the first thing that I wanted to do tonight, lest I forget, is to add the prayer postures that we picked up for our list as we went through the Chronicles and Kings, um, studying the prayers, and here they are for your list in case you missed one, or if you have another one, please type it into us. The first one is standing. We find that in 1 Chronicles 23, 30, in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 3. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 14, all passages that we studied, so the standing prayer. Then the sitting prayer we find in 2 Samuel 7, verse 18. We find bowing of the head in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 20. Do I need to slow down? Is everybody getting this? Bowing the head, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 20. And by the way, we've just picked that one up for our... Um, uh, most common prayer posture in worship today, I believe. But bowing the head is found in First Chronicles 29, verse 20. Kneeling on knees, kneeling on your knees with your hands spread toward heaven. We find that in Second Chronicles 6, verse 13. And in First Kings 8, verse 54, you'll remember that Solomon at the dedication of the temple. And then facing the wall, we find um, facing the wall in Second Kings 20, verse 2. And then the one that I, I feel like I, um, it was questionable whether this was really a, a prayer posture, but I believe Manasseh prayed as he was bound with fetters being carried away. And this is an example of praying when you are desperate, no matter where you are and what position you're in. And he was being carried away because of his wickedness in chains and fetters, and he cried out to God in Second Chronicles 33, verse 11. So that's about one, two, three, four, that's six new prayer postures from these studies that we've done this month. And if you have another one, uh, type it in for us, and we, we will bring that up. I, it's very possible that I missed one. Do we have any comments yet? Yes, uh, Minty Reagan Wellchant says slower, please. A little slower. Okay, I'm going to give those to you once more in case you miss one. Standing, 1 Chronicles 23, verse 30. It's also in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 3. Standing is also found in 1 Kings 8, verse 14. Then sitting... Sitting to pray is found in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 18. Bowing of the head is found in 1 Chronicles 29 
and verse 20. First Chronicles 29, verse 20. That's bowing. Kneeling on your knees with your hands spread out toward the heavens. And that is Solomon when he was dedicating the temple. We find it in Chronicles and in Kings. In Chronicles, it is in chapter 6 of Second Chronicles and verse 13. And it is found in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 54. And then facing the wall, I think that was Hezekiah. I've got to double check that. But that's in 2 Kings 20, verse 2. 2 Kings 20, verse 2, facing the wall. And then bound with fetters, that's Manasseh as he was being carried away and he cried out to God desperately, bound with chains and fetters. And that's in Second Chronicles 33, verse 11. Feel free to email me or Facebook me if you have questions about any of those and I'll throw those out again. I think to the wall was when Hezekiah had been told he was going to die. And he faced the wall and asked God for an mm -hmm. extension of life. I believe so too. Now then, let's go to the background of Chronicles. This is the part of my study that helped me the very most. Pondering why we have the Chronicles. Because they are so repetitive. Right. Because some of these passages, I don't know if you um, caught this, but you read almost verbatim right. what you had just read if you read the Chronicles first and then went and read the same account in the Kings. So my question as I began to study was, why do we have the Chronicles? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't throw anything um, extraneous in there for us there's a reason for everything that's in the Bible it's a perfect reason and so when I started studying the Chronicles I looked into the background and it is true that Chronicles repeats Kings a lot but it is not vain repetition no. it every thing that's included in the Chronicles everything that's added in the Chronicles that you don't read about in the Kings, and everything that's omitted from the Chronicles that you have read about in the Kings, every one of those things has a purpose. And it helps us if we look at the things that are omitted and the things that are added, it helps us to know the purpose of the Chronicles. So what is the, the one unifying idea in the Chronicles? As I thought about this, I looked, and uh, as I was doing some research, I read over and over and over and over about the temple. The temple is such a big theme in the book of Chronicles, and the emphasis in Chronicles is whatever you can do to put down or destroy idolatry and restore true worship, and of course, this restoration came along with the restoration of the temple. So whatever you can do to, to obliterate idolatry and put God on his throne is central to the theme of the Chronicles. And of course, the New Testament significance for us in that is great. It's colossal because our bodies as well as the kingdom today, are described as the temple, temple of, God. of God. And so what we do is be sure that we're keeping ourselves free of anything that takes the allegiance that belongs to God and gives it to somebody else, and that we are purified, sanctified, and holy, set apart from this world as the people of God. And so when we look at the, the emphasis of the temple, it becomes clear to us that that Chronicles is a book about getting rid of anything that takes our allegiance from the Holy God and gives it to something else. As I thought about this, it's pretty amazing that you read a lot about David in the Chronicles, but you don't read about Bathsheba. No. You don't read about Uriah. You don't read about Absalom's revolt. You don't read about Saul and Jonathan and that whole ordeal that happened with uh, Saul's envy. You don't read about any of that, but you read tons about David's preparation for the temple. That's what you read about in Chronicles is, is we're, we're getting to the temple again. And it's the same thing for Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Josiah and Asa. You realize that three verses are given to Hezekiah's reforms in the book of Kings. It's all about other stuff that happened in Hezekiah's life. But when you get to Chronicles, you've got three chapters. 
right. about Hezekiah's reforms, bringing the people out of idolatry and back to pure temple worship. So, you know, it is, it is just, it stares you in the face that while Kings tells the story of these kings, Chronicles says, look what they did to restore, to kick out idolatry or not. On the other hand, you know, like Manasseh, for instance, he, he put the idols back on their hills and he rebuilt, he started offering uh, children to Molech and right. all of those things. It is about whether or not they kept the temple pure. So it obviously has a temple theme, but still we get to this question of why. Why does it have a temple theme? Even the genealogies in chapters 1 through 9 always end up with uh, the people who are necessary for temple service. How the um, dues are going to be paid for the temple. How the priesthood's going to work in the temple. Who the musicians are going to be in the temple. Those genealogies, you notice, they just stop and right. say, these are the musicians, these right. are the porters, these are the priests. And it was all about the service for the temple. But why? Why would it be all this temple emphasis? Any ideas? Um, I haven't really thought about it that way. I was thinking while you were discussing this that I had heard that Chronicles was more the documentation of the legalities of the Jewish history. Well, again, that would be the reforms. That would be uh, bringing the Jews... It was a documentation because, think about this, this is just so interesting to me. All this stuff that happened in the Chronicles happened to Judah. We're talking about Judah here, which was the smaller part of the big kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff that's documented in the Chronicles here happened before they went to Babylon into captivity. Right. Right. All the stuff happened before. Right. But... When is it being put together into a chronicle? A chronicle means a story, mm -hmm. an account. So it's being put together, though. All the stuff happened before Babylon, but now it's being put together into these chronicles after they're back in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. after they're back there on the holy hill. And so it is this remnant, and you know a remnant is a piece of the, of the big fabric. It's this small number of people who have come back to Jerusalem. And think about this with me. It would be very, very difficult for you being a Jew, realizing that, man, think about the majesty that had been King David on the hill. Mm -hmm. King Solomon on the hill. The Queen of Sheba comes and says, I've, the half has never yet been told. All that had been on the hill. Right. And then they were carried away to captivity and they come back and there's no throne. Right. There's nothing left. There's no majesty about Jerusalem. And even, think about this too, even before, you, you remember how they came back? Mm -hmm. Nehemiah came back and rebuilt the wall right. of the city. But before Nehemiah had came back, Zerubbabel. Ezra and Zerubbabel mm -hmm. had to come back. And they were to rebuild the temple. Right. I want you to get that order. Right. The temple came first. The temple had to re be rebuilt before the city was rebuilt. And it's true today. If we want to, for instance, rebuild America, we need to get to the principles of God first. Right. That's the first thing. But... But really, when we talk about spiritual Israel today, is it America or is it the church? It's the church. It's the church. The spiritual Israel today is the church. And it's so important today that we rebuild spiritually what's in our hearts, our allegiance to God before we think about numbers and church buildings and campaigns and programs. We have to first rebuild right the temple and that's me and right. my relationship with the holy god well, and i have to get that right before i start thinking about we have to get that right as a people of god what is spiritual before we start thinking about numbers and growth right and i can tell you have a comment i was just going to say you asked me earlier what i thought about it could it be that god laid all this out 
in the Chronicles because, you know, today we have people that say, well, it doesn't matter how you worship God or it doesn't matter whether you do this or that. Is it possible that this was his way of showing that all these things do matter? I'm going to get to that. You know, they didn't have a throne left when they got back, but they had three things. And it's in these three things find great emphasis in the book of in the books of chronicles the first is the teachings of the past right they still had the teachings of the past um turn in your bible if you can to deuteronomy chapter 11 deuteronomy 11 and i'm, I'm going to have you read verses 26 to 28 this is god first saying to the people of israel as they um, are getting ready to um, become a nation really and enter the land of canaan and he says i'm laying out before you a blessing and a curse you get to pick and here's what he said deuteronomy 11 26 to 28 behold i set before you today a blessing and a curse the blessing If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. And that's what they did. They went after other gods. And as she reads that, what we really see is that those two verses are a microcosm of a huge amount of material in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy that tell the people, you, you're going to pick. If you follow me, you're going to be blessed. When you turn away from me, you're going to fall. And Chronicles is God's way of saying, look at all that's happened. Can you see this now? Can you see that there's a blessing and a curse and your behavior Look at the past. Look at what's happened in the past. And God is saying in Chronicles, and I know that it's difficult for me to, um, to articulate this when I'm talking about a whole big book of a whole lot of things that happened, but I hope you've been studying it. And I hope as you have, you have seen that when they were faithful, Hezekiah, the, the first half of his life, before that prayer, at the end of his life, everything was, he was so blessed of God. But when they turned away and were filled with pride, as he did in the end of his life, there's trouble. And that's what God is saying in Chronicles. Can you see now that what I told you back in Deuteronomy really has come to pass? And he even said, you'll go into captivity if you don't follow me. And that had come to pass. And they had seen all that. So they had the teaching of the past. And then they had the promise of the future. The Messiah was still supposed to come and reign from that holy hill of Jerusalem. A spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom, but it was going to emanate in Acts 2 from Jerusalem. So here they are in Jerusalem, and they've got the teaching of the past and the promise of the future. There's not a throne there now. Who is going to sit on the next throne? It's going to be the Messiah. Right. Jesus Christ is going to sit on the next throne. And so they had that. They had to restore Jerusalem. Because it was the center of the messianic prophecies. Right. And so they had the teaching of the past. They had the um, promise of the future. And then they had the present. Uh, this is two kind of presents. The present presence of God. They had that. And, and think about this with me. Think about, oh, think about what they were thinking as they got back home to Jerusalem. That those people who had been in uh, Babylonian ca- captivity... And then Cyrus and Persia had overcome Babylon and taken over Babylon. And from from that, Cyrus said, go back and build the temple. Wow. A a heathen king said, go back and build the temple. And and so this remnant of God's people went back to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple and then Nebuchadnezzar, remember, in Daniel 4, declared that he had been converted to the God of Jehovah, to to Jehovah God. Nebuchadnezzar, remember what a wicked king he was, and he declared he had been converted to, in Daniel 4, to Jehovah. And then Jeremiah, oh, they were so familiar with Jeremiah. We're about to get to him in two months down the road. But they knew Jeremiah, and he had predicted with uh, laser accuracy 
the uh, exact duration of the Babylonian captivity, and they were aware of that laser, laser accuracy that with which Jeremiah had predicted that, and now they're back. And imagine them thinking back and saying, I would have never believed God could have worked this way. Has he ever done stuff like that in your life? And you think... All the time. I can't believe God works this way. And, and that's where they were. And, and that presence of God was so important to their morale. And so from that book, we get... And, and by the way, those three things are really important to, to our choices today. We've got to look and say, you know... There's a way that seems right to man, and then there's this, and I, got, I get to pick. And ultimately, there's a blessing if I choose this, and there's a curse if I don't. And so it's very important to our choices today to read that what God said is really the way it happened. He really pinpointed exactly what was going to happen to the people if they failed him. And mm-hmm. as you said, they did. Okay. They went into captivity. God knows, and he still can tell us with laser accuracy what's going to occur if we fall from him. Is that the social gospel? Does that mean I'm going to, all my bills are going to be paid, and I'm not going to have any health issues if I follow him? No, but that means ultimately, as Romans 8, 28 says, what happens to me as his child is going to be for my ultimate good if I'm following him. Right. And... Uh, We could talk about that for a long time. But I want us now to, from that background, pull one blockbuster lesson from each instance of prayer that um, that we have studied this month in the time that remains. Now, what comments do we have? Okay, uh, first of all, Minty Reagan Wellchant says, thank you for slowing down. All right. <laughs> and, Love uh, you, Minty. Did that for you. <laughs> Shamika Hanna says, documentation of the past and reviewing what God promised and looking back at what he has done is a great faith builder for me. I need those times when things are tough. Yeah, and it's even good to write them down. You know, journaling is great for that. Right. And that's what the Chronicle is. It's a journal. And, you know, if there's something we can learn for them, from that, it's probably keeping up with what God's doing in our lives and, and keeping um, a record is, is a good thing right. of how he's answering our prayers. All right, so one, I hope we can get through these, and I'm not right. sure we can, but one blockbuster lesson from each instance of prayer. And that means we're not going to cover everything that I'd like to cover, but I want us to get one lesson from each one of these people. And by the way, Shamika is really Alyssa. Okay. Her name is Alyssa. She's in the Bahamas. Okay. And um, she is, and I didn't know that for a long time either, but I asked her one time and she she said, I'm really Alyssa. So um, we're glad you're here all the way from the Bahamas. And by the way, uh, pray for the Collies. We're we're starting to... um, and, and not that we're anything, but we are starting to travel again this month. And, and uh, Glenn will be in Mississippi this weekend. The following weekend, I think we're, we're in two different places. But I'll be speaking in uh, Florence, Alabama next weekend, the 17th, I believe that is. And then we leave on that Monday to go and work for about eight or ten days with the church in Honolulu. And so the next few days are... Um, eventful for us and pray for the word and pray pray for um, our safety and that we will do um, our very best as we go and do those things and if you're in any of those areas I'd really love to to get the chance to see you all right one blockbuster lesson from the praying men of chronicles the first one we study was Jabez and if you'll read the prayer of Jabez it's short from first chronicles 4 Verses 9 and 10, then we'll get this lesson from it. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. And I think King James says, so that I would not be grieved. Right. And you know, um, 
Bruce Wilkinson wrote the book The Prayer of Jabez in the year 2000 and uh, sold 9 million copies in two years. And his um, thesis of that book was pretty much if you pray this exact prayer for 30 days, you'll start seeing miracles in your life. That's not what the prayer of Jabez means. Obviously, that's not what the prayer of Jabez means because, uh, and he was, he, um, it was more of a social gospel that was um, proclaimed in the, the book, The Prayer of Jabez, because it was, it was material blessings will come your way right. if you pray this exact prayer. That's really not what the prayer of Jabez uh, was about at all. When we see, uh, and here's the blockbuster lesson, anything that's within the realm of the will of God is within the realm of the power of prayer. The first person I heard say that was Wendell Winkler. I'm sure others have said it. Anything that is within the realm of the will of God is within the realm of the power of prayer. I hope you got that. Anything that's within the realm of the will of God is within the realm of the power of prayer. That means that do I want anything that's not within the realm of the will of God? I don't. Right. So everything that I need and want is within the realm of the power of my petition to the throne of God. I think that's evident from Jabez's prayer because he prayed for the hand of God to be on him. He prayed to be kept from evil. He prayed to be kept from evil so that he wouldn't be grieved. And I don't believe, uh, I looked up that word for evil, and that word could mean either um, danger or it could mean wickedness. I believe here it means wickedness. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think Jabez wanted to be in danger, but I believe here he was praying that he would be kept from wickedness because it was right in the context of the hand of God being on him and that he would not be grieved. And in the middle of all of that spiritual prayer for blessings of God, he prayed for an enlarged border. I believe Jabez wanted an enlarged border if it was within the realm of the will of God, if right. he could use that for the glory of God. If he, if he wanted it for selfish reasons, he wasn't honorable. Right. And it says there right. that he was honorable. So anything that is within the realm of the will of God is within the realm of the power of prayer. Do we have a comment? Um, no. Okay, no. let's go to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. That's in First Chronicles 5, verses 18 to 22. I don't want to read all of that. Let's turn over to First Chronicles chapter 5. And as we look at that, Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh were in a war. And, um, and their petition was heard, and God says, why? Uh, read verse 20. Go ahead and read okay. verse 20. And they were helped against them, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them. For they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer because they put their trust in him. All right. The point that I want to get from that is that faith, this is the blockbuster lesson from that prayer, faith is essential to prayer. That's simple, but we have to trust God if we want him to hear our prayers. Um, I wanted to look really quickly at, um, let me find this that I wanted to point out before we leave this, and that is that um, God heard this, this prayer, and it was a uh, congregational prayer, and God can hear our congregational prayers today, and we can pray as individuals or as congregations without trust. Can you think of some biblical examples of people who prayed but who really didn't trust as they were praying? I think about Abraham. He was, he was a praying man, but he really didn't believe for a long time that, that God was, was going to do what God said he was going to do. Well, he sort of asked God at one point, uh, can I not make this man my heir because here I am old and I still don't have children. And he didn't just do that with one man. He did that with two. He did that right. with his servant and with Ishmael. Right. He, didn't, he wasn't trusting for a long time there. He wasn't trusting and neither was Sarah, his wife. I think about um, Balaam. And he was talking to God, and God was telling him what to say to Balak. Mm -hmm. But he really knew what he wanted to say. Right. He really wanted to do it his way. Even though he was praying to God, he was saying, Okay, Lord, I'll, he was 
kicking and screaming as he went to do what God told him to do because he really didn't want to. He right. didn't have trust that if he, that if he obeyed God, that Israel and he would be blessed. Today, can we pray without trust? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. We can pray without trust. Do we pray for physical blessings when we're not doing Matthew 6, 33? Give us this day our daily bread. But, Lord, we're not tuned into seeking first the kingdom. That's right. praying without trusting that we're right. going to do it his way. Right. Do we pray for success while we compromise with the world? True success is... <laughs> living for God and going to heaven. Living your life and going to heaven. That is true success. And our kids say it every Sunday night Absolutely. and kids sing. And that's what it is, living our lives and going to heaven. Do we pray, do we pray for success while we're compromising with the world? And... And we're not going to have it. We're not going to have true success if we're compromising with the world. Do we pray for our children to um, have good influences and to grow up and be faithful Christians while we expose them to impure media? We pray we're for it. Praying without trust. Right. Because we're not trusting that God's way is the best way. And when we pray for things and um, our mouth says one thing and our feet and our hands go and do something else then we're praying without trust. And trust means taking to heart the promises that are in the Bible. Uh, think about, um, oh, Carol, what if you said to Don, honey, I trust you. I trust you to be the leader in our finances, but I'm going to handle the checkbook. Well, that won't happen for one thing. <laughs> well, but what if it did? Would you really be? I would not be trusting in trust. Him. No, you'd no. be saying something but doing something else, and that is not acting with trust. And and so, the lesson from Reuben Gad, the reason God heard Reuben Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, it says, was because they trusted in Him. And I'm reminded of. Um, James 1, 6, I believe it is, right below where it says if we ask for wisdom, and we're going to get to that, that God will give it to us. It says, and this is a Hannah's 100 verse. I can sing it better than I can say it. It says, but let him ask in faith, 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 without any doubt, doubting. For the one who doubts is like the wave of the wind, driven and tossed by the sea. But let not that man expect to receive anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man's unstable in all of his ways. Thank you for letting me sing that because I can <laughs> sing it, but I probably can't say it. Let him ask in faith, faith without any doubting. doubting. Because the one who doubts is like a the wave mind. of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. You've got to ask in faith. And that's the reason that God heard this prayer. Number three is David. And the first prayer of David is when he had been told that he couldn't build the temple. And in turn, when he was told that he's not the one to build a temple, he returned praise and glory and honor to God. And that prayer is found in um, 1 Chronicles 17 and in 2 Samuel verse 7. Because of our time limitations, excuse me, I'm not going to take the time to read that entire prayer, but he thanked God that his son was going to get to build the temple. He could have said, oh, God, I'm the man after your own heart. I'm the man who, but he didn't say any of that. He, he accepted God's answer that he couldn't build the temple. And he said, I'm going to prepare it for you anyway. But what I want us to notice about this is our prayers should reflect that we understand that the greatest among us are just servants in his house. The word servant if I counted right, and you ladies can count and correct me if I'm wrong, the word servant is in that prayer ten times. It's just a few verses. But David continually says, thy servant. Who am I to get to do this? Who is your servant that I can do this? Even prepare for the building of the temple. Thank you, Father, for letting this be my house. I am your servant. So the blockbuster truth from that is that in our prayers, we should recognize servanthood. That's what we are. We are just servants in his house. I think it's really interesting there, too, that, uh, and you interrupt me if you want to, but I think <laughs> that um, it's interesting that David was asking to build God a house, and God was saying, David, I'm going to build you a house. Right. 
and it was the house of David that God built that we are today. Right. We are the spiritual house of David, the house of Abraham today. And while David was saying, God, I'm going to build you a house, God was saying, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm building you one. And whatever we can say to God, God, I'm going to give you this. God looks right back at us and says, you can't right. really give me anything, right. but I can give you. And who, that is so important in our prayers to realize we're servants. Who had a better right, though, to ask God than David? Because God had put him on the throne. And, uh, you know, David, he wasn't thinking of himself as king. He was thinking of himself as your servant. servant. And, you know, it's great that we get to be the priest of God today. Yes. But yes. we got to think about ourselves as servants. And, and I, I noticed in Chronicles as I was reading today that God referred to those priests and said, you get to serve. Right. And we get to right. serve. And so servant ten times in that prayer of David. And that's pretty amazing. The second prayer of David is in First Chronicles 21. And that's when he numbered the people. Now, why was it wrong to number the people? Why do you think it was wrong for David to number the people in First Chronicles 21? You have an idea, Carol? Well, it says that the, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number the people. And then later, um, but Joab... Why was, it, why was that a bad thing? I mean, I know it's bad that the devil did it, but why... Why was number, counting the people? I mean, that just seems Because innocent. he was trusting in the people's power and not in God's power. David was wanting to extend his kingdom, wasn't yes. he? Yes. Without consulting mm -hmm. me, me, me. Right. Let me get a big kingdom here. Right. Without asking God if God wants me to have a big kingdom. Right. So how did, how did God then react to David's repentance? Go ahead and read, if you can read quickly, verses 8 through 12. Uh, 1 Chronicles 21. This is how God reacted to David's repentance. Okay. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land, which the angel of the Lord destroying through all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I shall should take back to him who sent me. Yeah. Okay, the blockbuster lesson, I'll go ahead and give you that, is my prayer for forgiveness does not absolve me of all the consequences of sin. I can be forgiven, but there are consequences to sin. Not eternal consequences if I'm forgiven, but there are consequences of sin in this lifetime, and that almost always applies. You can, you can be forgiven. You can cry out for forgiveness. But there will be consequences of sin. And here, I think it's just really interesting that God let David pick the consequence. And that's the only time I can think of where God said, you can pick your punishment. And yes. did you ever do that for your children? I did. Uh, yes, yes. I said, mm -hmm. okay, you know, this is what you've done, and it's serious. When my children were older. And I'm going to let you choose. Would you like to do without all electronics for this many days? Or would you like a spanking from your daddy? <laughs> They'd pick to be without electronics for 50 days yes. rather than get a spanking from their dad. Yes. It was just so hum humiliating, <laughs> I think. But, um, you know, here God says, which punishment do you want? And you remember David said, I want to be in your hand. I want you to be punishing me, but don't let me fall into the hands of other right. people. And so he re realized the mercy of God, unlike my children who did not realize the mercy <laughs> of their father. <laughs> but... What I want us to get from this is that my prayer forgiveness for forgiveness doesn't absolve me of the consequences of sin. Think about a bank executive today who um, absconds or extorts money from that bank. Um, perhaps he can be forgiven. 
Yes. But there are consequences. He'll never have that job again. Right. He will never be in charge of money like that again. Right. And there, are, and just as it uh, is in our world, it also is in the economy of God. There are consequences. Think about um, fornication in your marriage. Can you forgive a marriage partner without taking him back? Right. Yeah, you can. You can forgive, right. but that doesn't necessarily mean you can live with him again. Um, and that's why God gave in Matthew nineteen nine that. Um, that one exception for a marriage for life. Right. Um, I think about murder. You know, you can get forgiveness for murder, but you can't fix it. Well, I thought about abortion. You know, you can be forgiven for that, but you can't bring that baby back. Right. And I have personal friends who have um, committed that sin and who suffer every day mm -hmm. and will suffer every day of their lives right. because of that sin. I, I don't... Um, uh, certainly, my heart goes out to those people. They are forgiven. Right. They are serving God. They are going to be in heaven one day, and they're bringing their other children with them to right. heaven, and that child is already there. Right. But it can't be fixed as far as their psyche in this lifetime. Right. And I, I and thought also about. That. I thought also about what about the person who has an abortion, and something goes wrong, and she can never have any other children again. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of consequences that are, that are like, there are physical consequences. And there are people uh, who are survivors of botched abortions and right. who will live their lives with handicaps because right. of that. And right. we could go on and on about that. But sin, forgiveness, prayer doesn't absolve me of the consequences of sin. Do we have comments? Yet? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Alyssa says, what about Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief, Mark nine twenty four. Sometimes we want to trust and it is hard to. Does God see that and help us anyway? I say that all the time to God. I say that yes. constantly because we live in a world that attacks our faith. We live in a world that uh, sometimes I listen to people who are very, very, very smart who don't believe in God. And I think, could I have this all wrong? Right. Could I have this all wrong? Yes. Could I be living my life based on a lie? And then I say, God. Help my unbelief. Yes. Mm -hmm. Help me to get into your word. And, and God pities us because he knows our, that we're right. our frame. He knows that we're weak. Right. And he wants us to cry out to him, help thou mine unbelief. Right. What else? And then Maria Cowden says, amen. We find it hard to truly rely on anyone, including God. And, and that's uh, part of that is a result of our, um, our self our independent world, the yes. world that we live in, we don't want to reach out. Right. And when we stop reaching out to the people of God, we, we find ourselves ceasing to reach out for the help of God himself. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't want a cabin that's been offered to us. Well, she's, she's getting very personal here, but many times I've invited them to stay in my cabin. Her husband doesn't want to stay in my cabin because he doesn't want to depend on other people. He doesn't want to impose upon other people. And that, you know, that is um, not sinful, but um, that is a, something that we laugh about, about not being dependent on yeah. each other. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Avery Taylor says, because he did not inquire of God. That was, da I think oh, it was that's David. That's why we're talking about, yeah, he yeah. didn't inquire mm -hmm. of God before he numbered the people. Right. And then Maria Cowden said, uh, David's example of God's trust in this is amazing. And I, I think she's referring to when God gave him the option. Mm. Uh, mm. How he said, um, I want to be in your hand. Right. Right. Don't we all just want to be in the hand of God? And that's really what Jabez prayed for. Give me your hand, God. Yes. And if we, if we, if we are in the hand of God, one day we're going to end up around the throne of God. Right. And there is a throne in Jerusalem, in the new Jerusalem. And aren't we glad about that? Right. All right. Is there another comment? And then Maria says, God, uh, David trusting God to meet out his discipline. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and isn't that what um, successful discipline with our children is all about? It is, it is coming to a point where um, our children want to obey us because yeah. they trust us. Right. I remember... Um, you know, children are all different, but I remember Caleb even at a very young age saying when a big decision in our house was being made that affected him in a big, big way. And we said, well, what do you think about this, Caleb? And I remember he was in third grade, and he said, you know what? I would like to not say because I, I believe I'd rather trust what you and Dad decide about mm -hmm. this because you're going to decide the right thing. 
And we weren't necessarily wise enough to decide the right thing, but he believed that. And that's, and our God is wise enough. Right. He is all wise. And if we will trust him and say, Lord, help this to work out in, in the very best way. And all of us have um, things in our lives, whether it's aged parents or disease or children who are astray or whatever it is, where we just have to say, Lord, I'm going to do the best I can, but it's in your hands. Right. Okay, good. Um, we're going to move on now to David when he was gathering the gifts for the temple in First Chronicles 29. And there, um, in First Chronicles 29, and I'm not sure really which verse I want to go to, and you might be able to find it quicker than I am than I can, but there were several times when David said, and I'm in Second Chronicles, when he said to God, these things are really yours. We're not so great for bringing all these things together to build this temple because everything that we've assembled here to build this temple, verse 16, O oh Lord our God, all this store that we've prepared to build you a house for your holy name comes of your hand and it's all yours. I know, you're, my God, that you try the heart and you have pleasure in uprightness, but as for me and the uprightness of my heart, I've offered all these things. And now I've seen with joy your people, which are present here, offer willingly to you. But he keeps on saying, look at verse 14, read mm -hmm. verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you. And of your own, we have given you. Yeah, he didn't say, look, God, look how much we're given. He said, what a privilege it is to get to bring part of what belongs to you already back. Right. And um, so the blockbuster lesson from this prayer is whatever you're asking for or thanking for in your prayers is already his. Right. Exactly. Everything you ask for and everything you thank him for is his. It's none of it is yours, and that's the lesson from this. But I, I did want us to notice this. Do you think that giving liberally helps you pray more sincerely? Well, for me, giving liberally reminds me of what God has given to me. And to, Kyle Butt said in a lesson one time that, that uh, the more you give, the more you're going to get back. Not necessarily in material things, mm -hmm. but it, it happens that way. And listen to this. Um, there's a man in our congregation, and if, if you're here long enough, you'll recognize this, who when he prays for the missionaries that we support, he names every one of them. He names every specific place talks about some of the trials that they're going through especially in Ukraine right now and you can tell as he leads our congregation in prayer that he is really really tuned into the mission work he's fervent about the mission work and not very many people know this but he has fully supported from his pocket one of those missionaries fully supported personally his family one of those missionaries now do you think that his investment in our West Huntsville mission work makes a difference in his prayers oh absolutely I do I believe when we're liberal givers it's going to influence our interest our fervency of our prayers for the gospel do we have a comment quickly um, Alyssa says and I think she's referring to David uh, um, and his giving. She says it's amazing how he realized he shouldn't toot his own horn for the abundance of what was given. He thought like an humble servant. Right. And may we all do that. It's really difficult in our materialistic society. But may we all do that. Let's move to Solomon in 1 Kings 3 and 4. And the, the lesson there is always, always, always ask for wisdom. Just don't forget to ask for wisdom. If you can turn over to Proverbs 4, I'm going to have you read something from Proverbs 4 in just a minute. But we must always ask for wisdom. James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let her ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it will be given. 
Not it might be given, but it will be given. We've dissected that verse many times on this podcast, and so we won't do that tonight. But wisdom is something you can ask for, and it'll be given. And it's important to ask for it. The wisdom from above is described in the book of James, and that's also a Hannah Sanders song. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and reasonable, full of mercy and good works, unwavering without hypocrisy for the seed for the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown by those who seek peace i love that description of the wisdom from a, that is from above don't you want that wisdom and by the way that that is james 3 where that wisdom of god is described now i want you to read proverbs 4 verse 7 for me wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. I love the way that says that. In all you're getting, don't forget understanding. And wisdom is the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. And ask for wisdom. And God answered Solomon's prayer because he asked for the right thing. He asked for the principal thing. And of course, probably this proverb came from his pen. And then Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, and this was a long prayer that really uh, encapsulized the thesis of the book of Chronicles. And um, if you read, let's read chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles. Well, let's go to verse 23. Read that verse for us. Then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, bringing retribution on the wicked by bringing his way on his own head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. Right, you're going to give retribution on the wicked and you're going to justify the righteous. God knows. He gets it right every single time. Blockbuster lesson from that prayer, you're praying to the judge who always gets it right. You're praying to the judge who always gets it right. Don't worry about vengeance. Go to God and say, God, I know you got this. You will get this right. right. And then you pray, but Lord, I need more than your justice. I need your mercy. Um, so the, the blockbuster lesson from that prayer is you're praying to the judge who always gets it right. We're going to go on to Asa, and then we'll look at the comments. Asa is in Second Chronicles 14, 11. Uh, his prayer is there, and I love the way he prays. Let's read that real quickly. Verse 11 of Second Chronicles 14. Good King Asa. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. I love it. He's saying there, Lord, you can do it however you want to. You can do it with a whole bunch of people, or you can do it with a few people. He wasn't worried about how God did right. it. And the blockbuster lesson from that great prayer of Asa, and I wish we had to go had time to go through the list of, of Asa's virtues, but the blockbuster lesson there is God's able to do whatever he wants to do. Yes. Whatever he wants to do, he can do. And on my way here tonight about this podcast, I said, Lord, I just really can't believe that um, this little girl who... You know, I'm nothing. And I can't believe I get to talk to women over a tool like the Internet. And I can't believe that there are some women in various parts of the country who listen and, and are praying together and are studying together. Lord, how did you do that? But, Lord, you can do whatever you want to. And I know that whatever good is being done here through this could be multiplied. Lord, just take it and... And do whatever you can do and help it not to be about anybody. Right. Because you can do whatever you want to do and help me to believe that. And when I pray for my grandson, I don't pray that, and I did this for my children, I don't pray that he'll just grow up and be faithful. I, I want to pray big things. <laughs> I mean, that is big. If he's faithful and gets to go to heaven, that's enough. But I want him to be like Ezra in the Bible. I want him to lead God's people. Right. I want him to, to be the one who stands in the gap and restores and so I pray that his parents are putting that into his heart every single day right. because who, God can do anything he wants to do with little people and big people and lots of people and few people. And so I, I don't want to limit God in my prayers. God, you 
can do things that I can't even imagine. That's the, the blockbuster idea from Asa. God's able to do whatever he wants to do. Do we have a comment about that? I no. Two more I want to get to. Three more, really. There are no, they're, they're no comments You say right it now. if you want to say it, though, because we'll, we'll go over just a little bit. Because we started late. That'll be our excuse tonight. Yes. Hezekiah. Hezekiah. And the blockbuster lesson is, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you at the get-go here. I can misuse the answer to a prayer. And Hezekiah prayed some good things. But at the end of his life, he faced the wall. He was sick. He had a boil. He was going to die. Yeah. And he faced the wall, and he said he got to pray. Hezekiah got to pray in partnership with Isaiah. Right. I just can't mm-hmm. believe that. What, no. a, what a blessing to be able to pray with the Messianic prophet. Yes. And here he was about to die, and he prayed that he wouldn't die. And God said, I'm going to give you 15 more years. And then the bad stuff started happening. Right. In that 15 years, God said he lifted up his heart with pride. And he got really proud of all of his possessions. Mm-hmm. And he showed them off to the Babylonians. Yes. Who later came back and got them. Right. You know, he, right. he, 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 he was lifted up with pride. I want you to notice, too, and, and the blockbuster lesson is, you can get an answer to prayer, but that doesn't mean necessarily it's all going to be good. You've got to use the answer to prayer for his glory. And um, really, Hezekiah failed to do that. I, I don't want to shortchange him. He was a great man. Yes. But during those last 15 years of his life, and by the way, when he prayed for an extension of his life, did he have any children? Well, I, I'm not sure about that. But what I've always found interesting about his prayer and God granting him 15 more years is that that was during the time that Manasseh was born. And we we see what Manasseh did after Mm -hmm. he died. See, Manasseh was born. I don't think he had any children before that time. I don't think so. And Manasseh was born during that last 15 years. And so what Manasseh saw wasn't the good part of Hezekiah's no. life. It was the bad part of Hezekiah's life. It was the prideful part of Hezekiah's life. And Manasseh turned out to be horrible. Yes. Manasseh turned out to be worse than any other king before him. And he saw the bad part of his father's life. So you can misuse the answer to prayer. And I, you know, if I had been Hezekiah and I knew what was going to happen in those 15 years, I wouldn't have prayed for an extension to my life. I'd want to go on to glory as he was right. when, when he was about to die. So um, he, wrote, he raised Manasseh during a very ba- dark time yes. of his life, and Manasseh turned out very bad, and Manasseh's our next man. And Manasseh was bad, 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 bad. He rebuilt the groves. He had women. He offered children to Molech. He, he, was, a, he was the most horrible yes. example of a king that you can imagine until... He was carried away in chains right. and fetters. And he cried out to God at that time. And he changed at that time of his life. Sometimes, this is the blockbuster lesson, sometimes I need affliction to humble me in my prayer. Sometimes it is a time of affliction that will bring me to my knees and say, I need God. Was he a perfect man after that? Mm-hmm. I would doubt it. Right. But it was affliction that brought him to that point of humility. And sometimes we need affliction or trials to bring us to better prayer. It it said they hooked him. And I read that was possibly a nose hook. Mm. Mm. That would have been an affliction Mm. for me. And he cried out in that distress. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't want us to wait until we're in dire straits to call out upon God. Because we need to be cleansing our heart of any idols. Right. Long before we get into trouble because of that idolatry. Right. But sometimes we have to have affliction to bring us. Is it? And the question in your lesson, I think, was, is it okay to pray that bad things will happen to people if that's the only way they can come to God? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. If my children are walking away from the Lord or my husband or anybody that I love and I believe that some trial will help wake them up or if they hit rock bottom, right. it'll wake them up, I'm going to pray for that. I am going to pray that they, like the prodigal, will be in the pig pen and see that they need to return to the Father. And finally, Josiah, and then we're done. Here's the blockbuster lesson. Josiah started to reign when he was how old? Um, I think he was eight, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Okay, he was eight years old. And the blockbuster lesson is there is power and virtue 
in, in the prayer of youth. There is power, wait a minute, there is power in the virtue and prayer of youth. There is power in young people's virtue and prayer. Josiah was a great king. I want, I want you to notice this. Josiah was eight when he started to reign. So that means he was born late in the life of Manasseh. When was Manasseh's good part of life? At the very end. At of the his very life. end. So Josiah saw the good part of Manasseh's life, right. not the bad part. Right. Manasseh saw the bad part of Hezekiah's life, not the good part, and Manasseh turned out bad. Josiah saw the good part of Manasseh's life and turned out good. I think that's very interesting, and I understand that that's not really um, a hard, fast rule about Bible characters, but somebody was asking me, I kind of think it was Emily Anderson was asking me, how did Hezekiah's son turn out so bad? He saw the bad part of Hezekiah's right. life. And how did Manasseh's son turn out so good? Well, he saw the good part, the penitent, humble Manasseh. And I think it's very powerful. What our children are seeing in our homes is what they will be being in their homes one day. And that's a very potent reminder. Do we have comments as we close? Oh. Did you lose on. it? Yes, I lost it. Okay, well, while she's finding that, I'm going to go ahead and say okay. this. Our next podcast is on January 27th. I believe that's a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And we'll be talking about the Psalms and Ezra on that Tuesday night. So you have a little over three weeks to get the, get the January study done. And we'll look forward to that time together. Before we pray, are there other comments? Yes. Maria Cowden said Ephesians 3.20. And this was a scripture I had as well. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. It, it actually is to him who is able to do those things. Wow. To him, let there be yes. glory and honor and yes. power forever. That's a wonderful passage, okay? And then Alyssa says, yes, the evil son. I'm not sure what that's in regard to, but then she, there's, she has another comment. Sometimes the sickness is a chance to get right with God or to stay right with God. We should pray for his will above our desires and fears. Hezekiah should have done that. And Avery Taylor said, Manasseh is one of the greatest shows of mercy. Mm. And all of us need to remember as we cry out to the judge who always gets it right, that we don't want him to get it just exactly right No. when he's looking at us. No. Because we want to depend on Calvary. Right. And Calvary, that, that lamb was perfect. Right. Without blemish, without fault. And so he looks through the lens of Calvary when he looks at my sin. And his mercy overrules his justice because of Calvary. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thought. And it's through the cross that we can close with prayer tonight. Yes. Is there one more? Yes. Minty Reagan Wilchant says, thank you, Cindy. Love these blockbuster lessons. Well, it's fun for me. As I sat down at the lunch table today, I went over these blockbuster thoughts with my husband, and um, he said, I want to preach that. He said, <laughs> he said that is, um, he said, I, I love that. That's, that's a great lesson. And, of course, he, he didn't really mean that. He was encouraging me. <laughs> but, um, oh, I've never, ever been so taken with the book of Chronicles. I am um, I'm in love with this book. I was and I say that every time. I love this one. This is my favorite book. But I loved this study. It was a, an amazing study. I, I was just thinking, sitting here when you were talking at the beginning about Chronicles, I didn't have hardly any markings in my Bible for Chronicles. Mm. And now it's filled mm. with markings. Mm. Because I picked up... You know, in past podcasts, you've talked about the gems and things. Mm -hmm. And I picked up all kinds of gems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I didn't... And boy, we really have to limit what we talk about tonight. There's so much I wanted yes. to say from Chronicles, you know. <laughs> Who would have known? But God knows, doesn't he? And he yes. gives us just what we need all the time. So let's pray. Father, we are so, so very, very thankful for your word and for 
the amazing providential way that you have given us the words of the Holy Spirit, not the sense of, of your will toward us, but the words, the very words that are inerrant, breathed from on high. We're so thankful that we have those, Father, and we're so thankful that in America today we have them multiple copies digitally and in books in our homes and in our offices and in our cars and we can listen to them on audio and what a privilege what a privilege that is father how rich we are and help us to realize that we're without excuse if we're not in the word and help us father at this the beginning of a new year to encourage others to get into the word with us whether in the digging deep study or in in other studies or in reading or listening or whatever it might be, Father, we know that we can only become better as we are enriched by your word. Help us to be faithful to our congregations. Help us to be submissive to the authority of our leaders in your kingdom. Help us, Father, to be the kinds of wives and mothers that we should be and help us to be raising up future leaders for your kingdom and children who will one day be adults who are standing in the gap and leading your people in the ways that you would have them to go. We're so thankful, Father. We are so thankful for the family that you have given us, both congregationally and worldwide. You could have left us as islands and solitary people seeking your will, but you gave us a family. And help us, Father, to ever be grateful and to place that family even above our blood families, Father. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus, and who made this family possible, who made our communication with you possible, who left us the comforter, who gave us your word. We're so thankful for the Trinity, Father, for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and for the roles that you each play in our lives through your mercy and grace. Help us, Father, to one day be around the throne where we can praise you forever. And it's through that precious, holy lamb without blemish that we pray and that we live as we leave this place and go throughout this month. Help us as we study your word in the Psalms and the book of Ezra. Help us to glean, Father, and help us to grow and to take the invaluable lessons and give them to others as we have opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.